So we'll run through a routine shoulder series. This is position for biceps or on the thigh, but a little bit of external rotation is helpful. So we're going to start in a transverse plane. You'll need to angle up slightly and you run to the top of the groove like that. So a good picture, you have the lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity quite level and make the tendon uh, echogenic so it's not hypoechoic like that. We want to be able to measure around the periphery, check that there's not a bifid bicep, so a double biceps, or one that's partially subluxing out. And then we run down looking for an effusion. You can go as low as the pec insertion, so that's the pec insertion there, and come back up. So we'd image it up high in the groove, down low, and then also in longitudinal. So in the longitudinal, a good way to find that is to go medial in the true long axis of the body and then slide back out laterally until you see a, a bony lump that's lesser tubercle. Once you're on the lateral side of that you fall neatly into the bicipital groove and if we've got nice parallel white lines then we can measure the biceps just to show the radiologist what you're looking at and then come on down to the distal end. We call it an effusion if the fluid's about the same thickness as the distal biceps this is the little circumflex artery going around the humeral neck there. Come down into the muscular belly. So that's long head. If we keep our probe in long and slide across medially, we eventually run into the coracoid bone. So this is coracoid. And this skinny little tendon here, this is your short head of the biceps. Don't routinely have to image that, but it's very helpful if the long head's ruptured to tell them short head's intact. This muscular belly underneath is coracobrachialis. Now we can line up on that and slide back out laterally and we fall onto subscapularis in transverse. So I'll show you what that looks like. We might have to just externally rotate the arm. So if you pick it up, go out a little bit. So subscapularis in transverse is a slightly difficult one because it's a multi-pennate tendon so it never quite looks very uniform. You sort of get these three bundles. So in this patient, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's one bundle there with a black gap and then another bundle and then the lowest bundle. So when we're imaging, we generally do three long images of the lower, the mid and the upper. So I'll show you how to do that. So once you've got your bicipital groove, don't change anything except move medial. So if you see coracoid bone, you're too high for subscap, you want to come down and then add a little bit of external rotation. But if we're on the left shoulder, you only want the tip of the subscap pointing to about two o'clock. You don't want to go so far as that it's pointing to three o'clock or four o'clock. Well, the fibers go anisotropic here. Okay, so the, the best way to find it or start to image it is to go too low so that you're on like a muscular looking subscap, so we're not on the tendon yet. So you start at the very bottom. You can see it's not a true, true trans, it's more like an oblique. So the medial end points down. And then slide up slowly so you're on the first tendon bundle there. And we would begin imaging the lower fibres, probably too much zoom there. I'd probably go for a zoom box about that. So that's the lower, that's your first picture. Move up, that's the mid fibres. When you get to the upper fibres, your probe angle just comes slightly more superior in approach. And it doesn't have to look like a perfect triangle. See that? It's not perfectly triangular. That's because we're starting to see some of the fibres that are arching over the top of our long head at the biceps less external rotation can be helpful so we just brought the arm back in so this is all subscap here upper fibers and if that's ruptured then our biceps is going to be allowed to sublux medially and at that point you can also check if your biceps is subluxing by doing a little dynamic test like that supraspinatus can be a difficult tendon to come at but i'll give you a couple of tips so the first thing is don't take the arm back to the back pocket. It tends to make the patient internally rotate a little. So you want to tuck their wing in nice and close, encourage them to draw the scapula in, and aim for nice and low like that. So you don't want to pull the tendon too tight. 
And then you can see this natural groove here on every one. So that's the deltopectoral groove. So I'm going to use that as a landmark for when we approach the transverse view of supraspinatus, which we know is coming from the supraspinous fossa wrapping around to the front like that. And it sits immediately behind the biceps. So that groove is essentially where our biceps is. So what you do is you plonk the front of the probe right on that groove and imagine where a sleeve would sit. So the bottom of a cap sleeve, that's the angle that our camera's on. So you can see we've got the humeral shaft here and just the deltoid. So we're going to run up with the anterior edge of our camera on the biceps. You can see the bicipital groove starting to emerge there. When we get to the top here, the humeral head has a nice angular appearance. So this facet pointing the roof is superior facet. This is a little angle where it's now transitioning to the middle facet. So if I rock back, this facet is where infra inserts, and this facet is where supraspinatus inserts. OK, so you can see the camera's coming at it from a lateral approach. The minute I want to um, go any higher, I have to stand the camera up nice and tall. So I'm standing it up tall, and now the humeral head is rounded. You don't see those facets anymore. I'll just show you. We're now in the singlet view. So you kind of imagine where a, a seam on a shirt runs or a bag strap. That's the orientation of the camera. So I'll do that again. We start down here, look at the groove, run up from a sleeve view, over the crest of the shoulder. There we can see our facets, supra and infra. Keep coming up and we fall onto the cuff view. And to make it look nice here, just make sure that you overshoot it slightly by going too close to the neck and then lay the camera a little bit back flat towards the patient's face. And that gives you a nice bright interface over the anterior fibres of supra. So you want to see the coracohumeral ligament coming over the biceps tendon and slinging underneath the supra. And then the only way we know where we've transitioned to infra is because if we go back towards our sleeve view, we see a nice little knob. So that point indicates where supra finishes and infra starts. So that's looking like that. Okay, and now if I want to look at supraspinatus in longitudinal, the first thing I'm going to do is line up on the biceps. If I'm on the left shoulder, I'll put the grey stripe up or the marker dot. And you just start on that groove and start sweeping out at 90 degrees to your probe footprint until you bump over the lesser tuberosity. So here's lesser tuberosity. Put that in the middle of the screen. Keep going and you'll hit the groove where your biceps long head sits. And then what we want to do is put the peak of the biceps as it transitions above the groove in the middle of your screen. And we call this the rainbow view. So the rainbow view has to look really good. You've got to be able to see long header biceps coming up, peaking, and then diving away from you. Once that alignment is perfect, you're then ready to move the camera basically at a 90 degree angle to the orientation of your probe face. So we're going to migrate backwards this way, slowly. I'll show you. We fall onto a nice little triangle and that's the supraspinatus anterior fibres. We move back a little further, that's mid, a couple of millimetres more. We're on the posterior, and if we go too far, we fall onto infra. So the minute we see it change to a hypoechoic colour or look fluffy, ill-defined, you know you've gone too far and you're now on the middle facet. So lining up on the biceps only works for supraspinatus longitudinal view. So there's the rainbow again. Move back, that's supraspinatus anterior, mid, posterior, and then too far, and that's infra. Okay, and now to do infraspinatus, don't change anything. Just come back to the sleeve view. Run up until we see our change in the facet. So there is the transition point from supra to infra. Now we're going to move that little bony point to the left of the screen. Okay, 
And the tendon we're now seeing is infraspinatus in transverse. So obviously it looks a bit hypoechoic, we want to clean it up. So what we do now is we imagine the spine of the scapula, or you can palpate it, basically that line there. And we're going to rotate the camera just a, a few millimetres anti-clockwise to line up with where the infraspinatus muscle belly comes from. So we'll just show you that angle there. Okay. Now if that's not working and you've got like a, an intersection in the deltoid shadowing over the tendon, we can pull it out a little bit better by rotating the patient into internal rotation. So the back of your hand is going to slowly transition to the back pocket. Wonderful. So what I've had to do now is bring my camera back anteriorly and you can see infra is beautiful. So the triangle tip is pointing now the opposite direction to our supra. If I was to go back and find my biceps and the, and the superior facet, middle facet view, I go straight back to this groove. You can see biceps, how far it's rotated medially. There's our superior facet, there's the middle facet. You can see the change in bone angle. So this point here on the patient's skin is actually where the infra is starting. So that internal rotation on the arm has the effect of bringing the infra around really anterior. The same thing you could achieve by this view with the forearm dangling down. That also is internal rotation. And if you go for this same sort of singlet view like this, we land straight on infra. So that's another nice way to image the infra. Traditionally, we used to take the arm across the chest like this. But you can see it makes the infra slightly hypoechoic and half the tendon sort of hiding under the acromion. So we, we try and avoid that position now just because it distorts the tendon. So a bit like that is good for infra. The final tendon that we do is teres. So if I transition from infra to teres, I just basically move um, down the arm or distal and you can see a tendon that's half the thickness, that's teres. But the easiest way to image teres, if you're starting out, is hold the opposite thigh. You just take the spine of the scapula as what your probe orientation is going to be, but you plonk down about four, four fingers or three fingers below the shoulder tip. Okay, you're still sort of lined up with that roughly. And you just run up the back of the humerus until you hit the first tendon. So that first tendon there, that's teres. And you just make it nice and flat. Obviously, you don't want it sort of diving away from you or it looks hypoechoic. And that's teres. So if I go any higher now, I go straight back onto infra. But you can see that's a poor position for infra. It's not showing us the fibres. The final step with the 18-5 probe would be to look at the AC joint. You just line up with the collarbone. There's the joint. You can feel it there. Put the camera on in alignment with the collarbone. That's the AC joint there, so you scan from the back to the front. And then the CA ligament, which is very easy. We go back to the biceps in its groove. So we've got the lesser tuberosity here. We just slide over until we hit coracoid. So we've had to go up a little bit. We pivot on the coracoid because this is where the CA ligament attaches at one end. The other end of your camera points up to the acromion, so it's roughly shoulder tip to opposite elbow. And that's our CA ligament just there between the two white lines. Um, we can do dynamics there as well just by internal external rotation or lift like a bird swing out to the side. You can see um, supraspinatus sometimes bunches under the CA ligament. Let's do that again. So you can look for fluid under there as well. So that's a nice normal CA ligament. Posterior glenoid then, just get the patient to keep the palm up, tuck their wrist under their chest. We swap probes to a, a low resolution camera. Okay, and if you can sit slightly side saddle facing the TV there. Okay, there's two notches to look at between the spine of the scapula and the clavicle. We fan our camera through there. We're going to see the suprascapular notch. So 
So here we've got the trapezius muscle, followed by the supraspinatus muscle, and then in here the musculotendinous junction of the supra. We'll just drop your arm by your side, actually. This little notch here is suprascapular notch, so you're looking for a ganglion there. Then all we do is drop the other side of the spine of the scapula. Just drop over the edge. And this little groove here is the spinoglenoid notch. If you can see that, you're probably on infraspinatus, maybe teres. Then our posterior glenoid view that we want is just below that notch. So we slide down. And you'll notice the camera is slightly oblique, just pointing down that way medially. Okay, so now we're going to do our posterior glenoid view. So we keep the palm up, tuck in under the bust, sitting up straight. Just encourage your patient to straighten the spine. And then we're going to be watching this capsule slide over the labrum. This is scapula, this is humeral head. So just watch the capsule on external rotation, internal rotation. So we want to guide the patient through that movement. Make sure they touch their tummy each time. Don't come out too far. There's no point in coming that far. It's the first part of the external rotation shows us that lovely gliding movement back and forth of the capsule separate to the labrum. All right, so the last thing we're going to do is look at the bursa dynamically. So one of the ways to do that in most of the mild bursitis is you might not see too much in the way of bursal distortion just abducting like this. Um, you can pretend that they're punching up under someone's chin and forward elevate like that and you see it just immediately anterior to the acromion. But um, the most effective position for seeing bursal distortion is what I call scarecrow to stop sign. So it's similar to our sleeve to singlet view but we're going to ask the patient to bring the elbow roughly level with their shoulder. If they can't it's fine to drop it a little bit and this forearm must be pointing down then ergonomically you can rest your ulna on their shoulder and just sling your hand over. So we find that bicipital groove again and you've got your superior facet showing there, middle facet. Slide back until you find some acromion. So it's good to show the cuff disappearing under the acromion. So the tendon I'm on now is infra, that's infra in long. So what we're going to do is get the patient to transition up to a stop sign position and you felt that little bursa actually clicked under the acromion. We'll go a little slower. So that's infraspinatus disappearing. Stop there. That little bony knob is the changeover between superior facet and middle facet. So now if I go to medially, this is the supraspinatus disappearing under the acromion. Now we see biceps. It's going to disappear under the acromion. And we're left with those three little bundles of sub subscap and they pretty much make it under the acromion as well. So this is something that really makes your bursa bunch. If it's going to click and bunch, it'll do it in this position. You can see that one's gliding nicely. So you can watch it a few times. It sort of naturally thickens up, but it's definitely not bunching and then you know, reproducing any symptoms. So this is an asymptomatic patient. Okay, so that's scarecrow to stop sign. This is something that adhesive capsulitis patients can't do. They'll only make it sort of to this height. They'll rotate and get to about there, and their pain will be, you know, five out of 10, up to seven out of 10, okay? Um, so that's how you, it's another clinical sign of uh, adhesive cap. So for adhesive capsulitis, we did the posterior glenoid view, but we also do this view of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So what we do is we bring the patient's back of their hand just to their chin. That's about all they're capable of if they have it. This little fold on the humerus, we're going to line up with that. Hold the camera like this. You need to 12.5. And you push it up onto the humeral shaft. And once you can see the humeral shaft, we're just going to run back towards the axilla. Okay. If you land on a little hypochoic triangular muscle there, this is Terry's major. So we're not going to see the ligament very well at this point, so we want to, we want to go more anterior and up into the armpit. So it's a good idea to resist the movement by pushing on the top. Now we've just pushed up underneath, and the bit we want to measure is this little ligament here between the hyaline cartilage 
and the top of that echogenic line there, that's the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And our upper limit of normal is 2 mil. Thank you.